بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so uh, I'm sure all of us are very excited for today's lecture I'm not going to stand between you and our uh, expert except by setting it up inshallah ta'ala this issue of slavery and Islam and the reason why this topic is so difficult for us to discuss well there are many reasons but we as Muslims are primarily interested in how can we understand the fact that Islam maybe to potentially has allowed something that we are taught is so immoral. When Islam came, it abolished so many things. It abolished drinking alcohol. It eradicated or at least it wanted to eradicate racism. And alcohol and racism were rampant in a, across the globe. Our young men and women say, why didn't Islam come and eradicate slavery as well? That's a theological question. Why not? And on the flip side, we have those that want to reinterpret Islam completely when it comes to gender and sexuality and morality. And they say, look, you guys, you ultra-conservative folks, you're not advocating slavery anymore. So if we can get rid of slavery, why can't we get rid of gender and gender roles? If you guys are willing to abandon one aspect that was once upon a time a part of Islam, then why can't we also abandon another aspect? So we are stuck between a rock and a hard place. We are stuck between those groups that are saying, how could Islam have allowed it? How could Islam have allowed something that is so intrinsically evil? And they either reject Islam or our young men and women are doubting Islam. And on the other side, we have those that are saying, oh yeah, that's the whole point. Islam can evolve over time. Just like Islam evolved with slavery, so too they say to us, it should also evolve with same sex and with this and with that. Why can't we do that as well? And so that's why this topic is one that really does require so much talk and discussion. And I'm very, very honored and pleased to have with us today, Dr. Jonathan Brown. Dr. Jonathan Brown is the uh, Prince Walid ibn Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Dr. Brown received his BA in History from Georgetown in 2000. Uh, by the way, he converted to Islam in the late 90s. It's a personal, that's, that's, that's not on the official bio, but I'll tell you. He converted to Islam in high school. Uh, and Second year of university. Second year of university? Sorry. He converted to Islam second year of university. Okay, so he, he's not Sabiqun al awwalun he's Sabiqun al thaniun what is he? Uh, the second batch of converts, but pre-9-11, which is a very uh, important point and milestone. Uh, he finished his BA from Georgetown in 2000, and then his PhD from University of Chicago in 2006. And Dr. Brown has studied and conducted research in countries such as Egypt, Syria, Turkey, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, South Africa, India, Indonesia, Iran, all, all of these countries. His book publication include the canonization of Bukhari and Muslim, uh, Hadith, Muhammad's legacy in the medieval and modern world, Muhammad, a very short introduction, which was selected for the National Endowment for the Humanities Bridging Cultures Muslim Journeys bookshelf. His book, Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy, and it goes on and on and on. His he has published extensively in the fields of hadith, which is what he is primarily known for in the academic world, Islamic law, Salafism, Sufism, Arabic lexical theory, and pre-Islamic poetry. What have you not published on? Um, and he is the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and Islamic Law. Dr. Brown's current research interests include Islamic legal reform and a translation of Sahih al-Bukhari. He is also the director of research at the Yaqeen Institute. And I'm also very honored to say he is a very near and dear dear friend for a very long time alhamdulillah so when i invited him to come to east plano uh, he immediately jumped and agreed even though it was just a month's notice or so so alhamdulillah uh, he is here so without further ado should i tell you why they wrote the book or you're going to tell them why you wrote the book yeah i'll tell them why okay without further ado dr jonathan brown um okay bismillah a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillah rahman rahim إن الحمد لله وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. This this topic, well, actually all the topics I write about are, are personal topics in the sense that I um, I pick them because I have questions. Uh, I have questions, um, and I remember very clearly uh, when I 
had this question because that was just after I became Muslim. It would have been probably in the fall of 1997. And I remember uh, I was sitting in my old house, in my family's house in my old room, and I was reading a translation of the Quran. And um, I, uh, um, I came across the verse, uh, obviously I was reading translation, right? But the verse said, Darab Allahu mathalan abdul mamlukan la yaqtiru ala shay'in wa man razaqnahu minna rizqan hasana, right? So uh, God, the, the God uh, gives you a parable of a uh, slave who's owned and can't do anything. Uh, as opposed to someone who, you know, we presume a free person whom we got, we have given a goodly sustenance. And he spends out of that in secret and in private. And the, the, this actually is not making any law about slavery. It's, it's using this as a parable for talking about uh, idols that have no power versus God that has all power. But I remember being confused because I was thinking to myself, you know, how, how can God talk about slavery just kind of randomly and, and not say slavery is wrong because slavery I means slavery is wrong. How can you just talk about it like that and, and treat it like it's, it's, it's no big deal? Um, and, you know, I, I think maybe a lot of us read these verses in the Quran, or maybe especially uh, younger people read these verses in the Quran and don't really know what to make of them. And we kind of just kind of pass over them and then um, assume that there's some answer. But I think it causes a lot of doubt. And so, uh, when, I, when I decided to write this book was as after the ISIS thing happened, uh, because that was really, a, it was 2015, it really caused a crisis for a lot of young Muslims because they saw, um, you know, these people who said they were doing exactly what the Sharia, they were saying that they were doing exactly what the Quran and the Prophet alayhi salam had done uh, in taking slaves. And um, so a lot of young Muslims were sitting there saying, wait a second, you know, not only uh, does my scripture talk about slavery, but now people who say they're following that scripture and who can point clearly to verses in the Quran and the Sunnah are, are doing so in, in the name of Islam. And, and it was really uh, caused a lot of people to, to leave Islam, a lot of people to have doubts and a lot of um, uh, anxiety. So that's why I, 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 I wrote this book, um, which is here, Yasser has it, Sheikh Yasser, sorry. And uh, yes, it's fine. So I, I also forgot to thank you for inviting me and thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a really big honor um, and I hope this will be useful for you. I'm gonna talk about a huge amount of material. So I'm gonna go, if you're used to books of fiqh, this is a delil free book. This is not a book with adilla. This is a book that's mukhtasar because I'm gonna go through a lot of material. So I want you to turn your brains on high power, right? I'm gonna rely on high power, Texan high power, brain functioning. Yes, yes, that's a thing. Let's do that. Let's go with that, okay? Texas high power brain functioning. All right. Um, so uh, there's, there's, I remember when we, when we read these verses of the Quran, there's, there's two issues, right? One is the sort of like, how can God just mention slavery and not say slavery is wrong or you shouldn't have slaves? And the second thing, which is a, a sort of a compound problem, is how do we explain our sense of discomfort. So if we believe in that the Quran is the word of God and we believe that the sunnah uh, of the Prophet والسلام, is inspired by God and the Prophet is incapable of moral error, um, how do we also explain the fact that deep in our, in our guts we feel that slavery is wrong? I mean, how can the Quran be allowing something and in our guts we feel that it's, it's so wrong we can't conceive of it being allowed? How do we even conceptualize that just the existence of that feeling becomes a problem so these are the two things I want to talk about today one uh, sort of how do we make sense of the moral problem of slavery and then how do we make sense of our moral reaction to it and these are really what's called these are problems of what's called moral ontology now that's the the only really big word I'm going to use in this lecture I think a moral ontology. Well, ontology is a study of existence. And so moral ontology is really talking about what, what is morality? Where, where does it come from? What is the, the matter of morality? What is it made of? Uh, what does it weigh? Uh, what kinds of morality are there? Um, we all know slavery is wrong, right? I mean, if I go out and I ask random person on the street or ask one of you in the crowd just off the street, is slavery wrong? You're going to say, yes, of course it's wrong. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, 
if it's wrong, how come the Prophet ﷺ had slaves? How come the early Muslims had slaves? I mean, did they not know it was wrong? How do we, how do we answer this question? What does it mean to be, what kind of wrong is it? What kind of wrong is it? So these are questions that I want to try and talk about today. Okay, slavery is really hard to talk about. It's really hard to talk about globally. It's extremely hard to talk about in the United States. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first one is that in the United States, slavery is intimately and, con and con continues to be tied to the question of race. And you don't have to be very observant or have been in this country very long to know about issues of race in this country, especially between black Americans and white Americans. And these are, this was an issue that was formed and shaped by and then also shaped slavery in the United States. Right? So um, talking about slavery means talking about race. Um, and it's especially painful because the injustices and the harms caused by slavery in the United States continue to be, or cont continue to be with us in our society. So it's a, it's a live wire, not in the sense that it's, you know, uh, uh, it's sensitive, it's that it's actually a real living problem. Okay. The second reason it's very difficult to talk about is because it involves tying our brain in knots. It involves tying our brain in knots, and people don't like to do that. It causes them anxiety. I'm going to give you an example. Who remembers the Charlottesville protests in 2017, summer of 2017? Charlottesville, Virginia, University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson. Of course, there's a nice big statue of Thomas Jefferson there. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was the author of the Declaration of Independence, one of the leading thinkers of the American Revolution, a man who believed in freedom of democracy, and a man who had a lot of slaves and had children with one of his slave women, right? Um, who, those children were then also slaves. He eventually freed them, but they were also slaves. So what, there were a lot of protesters at um, the University of Virginia saying uh, slavery is an evil. It's a great, it's history's greatest crime. It's wrong no matter where you are or when. And we don't want a statue of a guy who was a slave owner and who raped a slave woman up in front of our university. That's a pretty good argument, right? I mean, that's like a pretty good logical argument. Slavery is evil. This guy did slavery. Statue's got to go. Donald Trump came out. And he summarized the situation in a way that remarkably only he could do. He said, um, George Washington's a slave owner. Are you going to take down statues of George Washington? Imagine taking down every statue of George Washington. Imagine renaming everything that's called Washington. It's topographically or toponymically exhausting to think about that. And it's just impossible politically in the United States to talk about this issue. Wait a second. We have a contradiction here. Slavery is evil. George Washington was a slave owner. Why do we name everything after him? So this is the, what I call the slavery conundrum. There's an American slavery conundrum and there's an Islamic slavery conundrum. And they're very similar to one another. But I'll give you the, basically the slavery conundrum. The slavery conundrum is that there are three things, there are three axioms that we have to hold in modern America and in the modern West and maybe in the modern world. There's three things, three axioms we have to hold in our mind, but it's impossible to hold all three in your mind at the same time because they're contradictory. What are they? First, slavery is an intrinsic and gross moral evil. What does that mean, intrinsic? It means that slavery itself is evil. It's not slavery is evil because it makes you sad. It's not slavery evil because you're miserable. It's not slavery is evil because it causes abusive rights. Slavery in and of itself is evil. And it's not just, you know, a little evil like me, you know, smacking Yes, or on the back of the head for no reason. This is a gross evil. This is never the lesser of two evils. This is never the thing you can do because there's something you think is more harmful. It is never excusable. It is a gross and intrinsic evil across space and time. What do I mean across space and time? Was slavery wrong when Thomas Jefferson did it? Speak, t talk to me like Americans. Tell me. Give me the American answer. Was slavery wrong when Thomas Jefferson did it? Yes. yes. 
Okay, was slavery wrong during the Roman period? Yes. Was slavery wrong during the Egyptian times? Yes. It was throughout space and time. Second, so that's the first axiom. What's the second axiom? Imagine this. Go into a, what do you guys have instead of dinner parties here? Barbecues? Biryani parties. Yeah, but I want something with non-Muslims. Yeah, barbecues. Yeah. Okay, barbecues. Imagine you go to your company barbecue, and someone asks you about slavery in Islam. And you say, yeah, there, there is slavery, but it's, it wasn't that bad. How, how is that barbecue going to go for you? Well, I don't know, actually. Texas, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, okay, I'm going to retract that comment, edit that out of the video. My, half my family is from Texas, so I have love for this place. Um, but the point is, the second axiom, all slavery is slavery. There's no, uh, you're not allowed to make distinctions within slavery. There's no good slavery and bad slavery. There's no benevolent slavery and harmful slavery. All slavery is slavery. Okay? So that's axiom number two. Axiom number three, our past, our past has some kind of moral or legal right over us. It has some kind of moral or legal power over us. It has some kind of moral or legal authority over us. If you're a Muslim, we know what that is, right? The Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet are our sources of guidance and morality. If God commands us to do something, if the Prophet commands us to do something, we say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا Right? What is justice? It's what God commands. What is injustice? What God forbids. If you're American, maybe it's not that dramatic, but the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, these people have authority over us. I mean, we might disagree with them, but their ideas, their writings define our political life. Right? I mean, try going into a barbecue and just say, you know, George Washington was a real piece of, you know what. See what happens. You know, it's not going to go very well. What's the problem here? These three axioms cannot be held at the same time. So I say, okay, um, yes, Thomas Jefferson had slaves, but it was different back then. I can't say that. Slavery is a transhistorical evil throughout space and time. Yeah, yeah, there is slavery in the Bible, but slavery in the Bible is not that, it's not like slavery in America. It's not that bad. Oh, you're saying there's some kind of slavery that's okay? So here's the problem. There is no religious or philosophical tradition that I know of, and I've done a lot of research on this. There is no philosophical or religious tradition that I know of that did not either defend, accept, or condone slavery until the 1600s, at the various, or very earliest 1600s. So there's, no, there's nobody who's going to be okay to follow. There's no one who's going to be free of the taint of slavery from world history, essentially, before the 1600s. So we have a problem. We have a, two axioms. Slavery is a gross intrinsic evil throughout space and time. All slavery is slavery. That force us to condemn everything in our past, essentially. Whether you're Americans or Muslims or Hindu or Buddhist or that's a really big problem. So we have in our minds a knot that is that something that actually cannot hold together. It can't hold together. And the second you start picking at that or at talking about that, the pieces start to fall apart. People don't like to talk about it. Why does this conundrum exist? Why does this conundrum exist? It's actually a result. It's also a result and a product of abolitionist discourse. So abolitionist discourse in the United States and Britain from the late 1700s into the mid-1800s argued that all slavery was a gross and intrinsic evil that had to be gotten rid of immediately. Why did it make this argument? If you're an abolitionist and you're willing to talk about some kinds of slavery being good and some kind of slavery being bad, 
what is the slave owner you're arguing going to say? Oh, look, yeah, I agree with you. Slavery is evil. I mean, when it's done badly. But my slaves, come look at them. They're so happy. Look how, look how good I take care of them, right? Or, yes, we know you, slavery in, the Medi- in the, maybe the Caribbean is bad or in the Americas are bad, but slavery in India, this is very different, right? This is not se- se- severe. So the second you start ta- allowing distinctions within this concept of slavery, you lose your, you're, you're essentially unable to force your, uh, your opponents into accepting your position. It opens the door of negotiation. So the, ultimately, the, the abolitionist position became all slavery in and of itself, by fact of it being slavery per se, cannot be accepted. It's all uh, intrinsically evil. The problem is, if you're a historian who wants to look at slavery in world history, what are you going to notice? You're going to notice that Slavery, let's say, in India is really different from slavery in the Americas, or that slavery in Istanbul is really different from slavery in Southeast Asia. And so you're going to start actually talking about these distinctions that will start to unpick, pull the threads out of this abolitionist argument. So that's why this, this, this discussion can't, cannot, it, it, it's not easy for us to have it, because it starts to pick at the very abolitionist consensus that is held worldwide today. Okay. Um, the abolitionist movement, as I said, that developed in the United States and uh, Great Britain in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, defines slavery illegally. It defined it through a legal definition. What does that mean? It talked about a certain kind of relationship or institution that it called slavery. It didn't talk about conditions. So it looked at the legal definition of relationship, not at conditions. Why would it not look at conditions? Why would it look at a legal definition? In this case, the idea that someone is owned by another person. Why would it do that and not look at conditions? Because if you're an abolitionist, let's say, arguing with a southern slave owner in the United States, and you start saying slavery is about someone being in bad conditions, work conditions, or living conditions, that southern slave owner is just going to say, oh yeah, look at your factory workers they look actually more miserable than, than my slaves. So they didn't want to have, they don't, you don't want to have that discussion. You want to open that door. So slavery is a, defined as a, as a legal relationship. So what are the, um, the problem is though, sorry, the problem is that this, uh, one of the premises of the slavery conundrum, right, is that slavery is a gross and intrinsic evil across space and time. It's not about slavery's evil in our society. It's not about slavery's evil in the modern West or in Western Europe or in the Americas. It's slavery's evil throughout history, backwards and forwards in time, across the world, wherever you are. So the problem is coming up with a definition for slavery that works in all those times and places is basically impossible. It's basically impossible you end up with definitions that are so abstract, they're so abstract that they ultimately result in us projecting our own assumptions and understandings onto the past. What do I mean by that? Let's just look at three ways that have been used to define slavery. First, slavery is lack of freedom. Slavery is when someone is not free. Okay, here's the problem. We could say, let's say in the United States, we could define freedom. We could maybe even define freedom in the West, but how do you define freedom throughout human history? What is it to be free? For in Roman law and in Western legal tradition, free means you can do whatever you want except what the law prohibits, right? Okay, but what's being a slave? Slave is you can do whatever you want except what your master prohibits. So freedom and slavery are not Freedom is not a complete lack of restraint or constraint. Freedom is just less constraint than a slave has. And exactly what constraints a free person has on them and exactly what constraints a slave has on them differ from time to time and place to place. And if you were to sit around and say, or you're going to make an argument that, uh, uh, well, a slave is always denied basic rights. What basic rights? 
Actually, you can't find a consistent notion of what the basic rights that, that slaves or non-slaves should have in human history. You could say, well, at the very least, let's say a slave um, can't, you know, a slave maybe you can just, you can just go and kill and uh, you can't do that to a free person. But that's actually not true. Most slave systems in world history, most slave systems in world history, you could not just kill a slave, even their owner. And by the way, under Roman law, until the second century AD, in theory, a father could kill his own child with no legal consequences. It's called patria potestas. So in Roman law, a father or the head of a family, the male head of a family, could kill anyone in his own family with no legal consequences in theory. It didn't really happen, but in theory. So even the notion that, you know, the idea, oh, well, a slave, you use someone you can just do anything to and have no consequences, that doesn't help you in Roman law because that also describes a father of a free person or the status of a free child. You could say, well, let's define slavery as property, somebody being the property of another person. How do you define property? In the Western legal tradition, we can define property, it's usually it's like a bundle of rights, the right to use, the right to exclude, the right to sell, the right to destroy. But some of the, sometimes you have some of those rights and you own something. For example, you can't do whatever you want with your house, you own your house. You can't do whatever you want with your pets and you own your pets. You can't sit there and torture your pet right? It's against the law. Um, but if you have a, let's say, a Van Gogh painting and you just feel like being a jerk, you can destroy that Van Gogh painting. It's just yours. So th- property, what it means for owning different things is different, even in one society. Then try and come up with a definition that it, for property across world history. You end up with something like this. Property is a person having some kind of rights over something. And then so slavery would be one person having some kind of rights over another person, which basically describes almost any relationship. Um, Sometimes we talk about defining slavery as coercion, coercive power over somebody. Same problem. How do you define coercion? We could come up with a clear understanding in the United States about what was unacceptable coercion in a relationship, but then to say we can make this, project this definition across world history, Almost nobody in world history would be free if they lived up to like modern American labor standards for what is a coercive relationship. I just, uh, on the airplane here, I watched part of Wonder Woman. I, I, it was, it's research. Look, it's going, it's, it's going into my talk. Okay. Um, so there's a scene where she's, Wonder Woman is like World War I. Do you guys see the movie? No, okay, they didn't watch it in room. So basically, she, she comes to England in World War I, and she's from some island that's stuck in ancient Greece history, and so she meets this woman who's a secretary of the guy, and uh, he, she says, what's a secretary? And the woman says, well, I, wherever he says, whatever he says to do, I do, and wherever he says to go, I go. And Wonder Woman says, where I come from, we call that slavery, right? So there's this kind of notion there that... Um, like it's the idea is the filmmakers are saying that mo- you know, modern laborers or tr- treatment of women in the workforce is kind of like slavery. Um, the pro- this, as you can imagine from the example I just gave you, this gets very political. This gets very political even in, um, let's just say, the modern United States, let alone globally. So one example of this is in the, in the 1790s in England and Scotland, there were these people working in, in Scotland in coal mines and there was actually a debate about whether or not these people were slaves or not. In fact, they would sometimes wear collars with their master's name on them. These were white, like Scottish people. And the main argument for them not being slaves wasn't about how they were treated or whether or not they were born into slavery or not. It was the fact that people had decided there was no slavery in England. After the 1770s, there was no slavery in England. So it was, like a polit- it was basically a political statement about the nature of British society that defined whether these people were slaves or not, not how they were treated even. Uh, another great example of this is this notion of mo- modern day slavery, which I'm sure you read about in the newspaper or in magazines, or hear about on the news. So in 1957, there's a major convention 
called the, 1926 there's a major convention for the outlawing of slavery globally. And in 1950, 1957 there's a supplementary convention. So the 1926 convention is about outlawing slavery. 1957 convention is about outlawing things that are like slavery but not slavery. And one of those is what's called bonded labor. Bonded labor means um, I agree to work for you for a certain amount of time and in return, you know, you pay for my trip to Dallas, Texas and you uh, pay for my housing and I work for you for 10 years and then after that, you know, maybe I can stay here but we're done. So that's, sometimes it's called indentured service or bonded labor, right? So in the 1957 convention, Bonded labor is not slavery. It is servitude that is similar to slavery, but not slavery. According to the, what's called the new slavery or modern day slavery, as it's been understood from the late 1990s until today, the major portion, one of the largest, if not the largest portion of global slavery today is bonded labor. So what you see is actually, it's like an inflation, inflation in the concept of slavery. What was not slavery in 1957 has become slavery today. Another example of this is prison labor. So in the, in the late 1990s, some advocates for prison right, prisoners' rights in the United States started saying that prisoners in the United States are essentially slaves because the 13th Amendment in the United States Constitution does not allow forced labor and slavery except for people who are in prison. Those people can be forced to work for essentially no pay. People didn't really accept this argument. But now, what do you see? Even scholars of new slavery and, and people who are major advocates of what's called new abolition, new abolitionism. In 2006, they did not accept that slaves in Amer that people, prisoners in American prisons were slaves. Now those same people are saying, we're reconsidering it. We're reconsidering it. What changed? Did the conditions of American prisoners change? No. Did the definition of slavery change? No. It's just a political, political circumstances changed. Things like Black Lives Matter, movies like, uh, documentaries like 13th. And now, um, again, yes or sorry, but this is research, Thor Ragnarok, who saw Thor Ragnarok? Okay, I shouldn't ask these questions at this mosque, okay? None of you saw Thor Ragnarok, nor should you. I did it for research purposes. In Thor Ragnarok, there's this alien master of this planet who runs like this gladiatorial competition played by Jeff Goldblum. And he's sort of this very schmarmy politician, kind of corporate politician. And uh, there's these gladiators are rebelling. And his, you know, his minister comes up and says, sir, the slaves are revolting. And he says, no, no, don't say that. Don't say that word. And they say, what, revolting? He says, no, no, the S word. Don't say the S word. And then the person says, sorry, the prisoners with jobs are revolting. So, and then when you, when you get Hollywood behind you, Hollywood behind the idea that American prisoners are actually slave laborers, you can see how much this, this has changed since the, the late 1990s when saying American prisoners were, were slaves would just sort of fall on deaf ears and maybe even can be considered unpatriotic. Okay, so you have this notion of, even in the last couple of decades, an, an inflation, an inflation, like a devaluing, a devaluing of the, 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 the moral power or the, 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 the power of the word slave. Uh, another example, by the way, is, I know this is in Texas, the idea that the Irish, that the white people who came to America were slaves because they were indentured servants. Is this, I think this, isn't this taught in the Texas school curriculum? Someone told me this. Okay, I don't know about this, but someone told me this. I'll have to reevaluate this, but... It was. So, so there's this, you, you see the idea that, like my, my ancestors, some of them came to the U.S. to then the Brit North American British colonies as indentured servants. And so the, the argument of some kind of white nationalists is that, well, yeah, we had slavery in America, slavery of black people, but white people were also slaves because they were indentured servants. And to which a lot of African Americans would say, what the hell are you talking about? Those people chose to come whereas my ancestor was just grabbed and sold, right? Uh, but here's the problem. The mod by the modern definitions of new slavery, those white people were slaves. 
So when you start talking about projecting some of these definitions backwards in time, it starts to mess with what we're cons- how we conceptualize slavery in history, what we're willing to accept as slavery versus what we're not willing to accept. Okay. Um, we end up with situations where we come up with definitions for slavery, but those things, those, that definition, ends up including something in history that we don't really think is slavery versus other things that look a lot like slavery to us but don't fit our definition. So we end up with definitions that don't really work. We're not able to put everything we want into the definition and exclude the things we don't want. So up here on the screen, you have two figures. On the right would be uh, Malik Ambar. Malik Ambar died in 1626. He's an Ethiopian slave general who was brought to the Deccan city of Ahmed, Ahmed Nagar and was a senior general there and then eventually became like the power behind the throne and the regent in that city. On the left-hand side, you have Sokulu Mehmed Pasha. He's sitting there presiding over a bunch of heads. Yes, those are heads of enemy soldiers. He was the grand vizier, he died in 1579, the grand vizier of three Ottoman sultans. Three Ottoman sultans. His um, family made him a slave when he was 18 years old. He was a Serb from a Serbian Christian family, and they made him a fam- they gave him to the Sultan as a slave when he was 18 years old, so that he could become a powerful member of the Ottoman administration. Because the senior administration of the Ottoman Empire at this time and for another century after that were all slaves. He was the most powerful, except for the Sultan, the most powerful person in the Ottoman Empire for decades the richest and most powerful. He was married to one of the sultan's daughters, actually, and yet he was technically a slave. So are we really going to say that Sokolo Mehmed Pasha is an example of the same phenomenon as a field hand being lashed in the summer heat of South Carolina in the year 1750? Are we really going to say this is the same phenomenon? And if we... If we say we can't make internal distinctions because all slavery is slavery, what is that? That really handicaps us morally. I mean, we, we end up making the same moral judgment for these two different situations that are so dramatically disparate from one another. And, not, and just so you know, this isn't just a, you know, a, you know a, what you think you're going to get in trouble for saying at a barbecue. This is even true amongst academics. There's a, one of the leading... Uh, scholars of slavery in American history. I was listening to a speech she gave, and she was talking about the conditions between slaves in the field versus slaves in urban areas in the American South. And someone asked her, so how, how do the, the conditions differ? And she's, she was about to say something, and she stopped herself. And she said, I was about to say one is better than the other. But, but she says, basically, we don't, this is not appropriate. We don't like to talk about one thing being better than the other because they don't want to introduce the concept of saying one kind of slavery is better than the other because axiom number two is all, slaves, all slavery is slavery. You can't make internal distinctions. Okay, so this leads us to two major handicaps. One, we can't make different moral judgments about things that are very different. And two, the political nature of this means that slavery is usually what other people do. This has changed a little bit in the last couple of years because of um, increased American willingness to really turn a critical eye on, let's say, American prisons and American labor market. But you you probably all recognize that this discussion about uh, American prisoners being slaves, this is not, this is not very popular. This wasn't very popular a few years ago. It's only kind of become popular, I think, as a result of Donald Trump and sort of a notion of a, a sort of far left resistance to Donald Trump, which has really made palatable a lot of ideas that would not have been acceptable at all in mainstream American society 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Okay. That's the first issue about um, kind of thinking about the definition of slavery and the slavery conundrum. Why is it so hard to talk about? Because it ties our mind in knots. It makes us hold internally contradictory ideas. So let's talk about abolition and the origins of abolition. There's two narratives 
about this. The popular narrative, which is also, by the way, a major scholarly narrative, is what? You can call it the moral awakening narrative. So what happens? Some point in the distant past, there was a few voices who said, slavery is wrong. And those people went out and argued, and then more people agreed with that, and then more people agreed with that, and then more people agreed with that. And then in the 1700s, it sort of grew into a sort of snowballed to have real substance and real mass. And then in the 1800s, uh, especially in places where humans had become enlightened by the enlightenment, like Great Britain and the United States, northern United States, people realized slavery was a gross intrinsic evil and had to be ended. And then they eventually convinced everybody in the whole world. And that's how we get to the modern day abolitionist consensus, which is that slavery is a transhistorical moral evil and it needs to be removed from the face of the earth. Right? That's the, what we can call the moral awakening narrative. There's a couple problems with the moral awakening narrative. Um, as I said before, there's no religion or philosophical tradition that condemns slavery qua slavery, that condemns slavery as slavery until the very earliest of the 1600s. Aristotle, Plato, St. Augustine, the Buddha, Jesus, Moses, the Prophet Muhammad, St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, you just name, I mean, just, I can just go through the history of humanity. There's nobody who said slavery is in and of itself a moral evil. They could criticize abuses of slavery. They could criticize the wrong people being enslaved. But there was no moral minority saying that slavery was evil. I've counted, and I've done a lot of research on this. I've counted one person. Like, I don't mean one group of people. I mean one person prior to the 1500s, who said slavery, qua slavery, was evil. It was a person named Gregory of Nyssa. He died in 1394. Sorry, uh, 394, my bad. 394, the common era. He was from Cappadocia and Andalusia, and he was a church father there. He said, philosophically and theologically, slavery is wrong. That's it. Until the, early, until the late 1500s, there was a guy named Jean Baudin in France, died 1596. He says also slavery is wrong, it's evil, it harms the slave, it harms the master. And then in the late 1600s, you see it amongst American Quakers. There's when you see the real beginning of abolitionist, about abolition, the idea that slavery as an institution needs to be gotten rid of. And then it really picks up in the 1700s and the 1800s. So if this is a moral awakening, it means that basically all of humanity was sound asleep out to lunch until the 1600s. The greatest minds, the most righteous and pious souls of every single religion and philosophical tradition didn't know that slavery was wrong. Or what's worse, maybe they know and didn't say anything. What's the, I forget which one it is. Yeah, so if you if you, uh, you know, what's worse, that they didn't know or they did know and they knew and didn't say anything? The point is, uh, does this mean that a person today who knows slavery is wrong is more morally intelligent than Plato or Aristotle or Jesus or Moses or the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I mean, forget about the, the theological problem that caused for Muslims. Just think about what that means about, I mean, why do we read any of their books? I mean, why, why do we have any respect? I mean, if, if we're going to take down Thomas Jefferson's statues, let's get rid of all these, this entire heritage. So that's the, the, the second problem with the moral awakening narrative is what was brought up by especially historians from outside the first world, outside kind of North, the U.S. and Europe in the mid-20th century. And this is what you, was called the kind of economic narrative or economic explanation. Okay, so I told you before, it's really in the 1700s that abolitionism starts 
getting, gaining a lot of momentum, and the 1800s. Does anyone know anything else that was happening in that time period? Industrial Revolution, right? So is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that people start to say that slavery is a moral evil in precisely those places, namely Great Britain and the Northern United States, precisely in those places where one, the industrial, earliest stages of the Industrial Revolution take place, and two, where people achieved unprecedented wealth without reliance on slavery. Is that coincidence? Aristotle made a very prescient point. You guys know Aristotle died 322 BC. Greek guy, lots of statues. He said, there will be slavery until looms spin themselves. You guys know what a loom is? Like a thing that weaves cloth. Until they move themselves, they'll be slaves. When did slavery become something that people talked about getting rid of? When human beings discovered that you can use water power and then fossil fuels to move things that used to be moved by animals and humans. That simply can't, I just, do, I just simply can't accept that as a, as, that that's a coincidence. Right? Um, here's the problem. Wait, you say, Professor Brown, you're telling me that abolition became a phenomenon with strength, that it even became something of note at all because of technology and economics, but what I feel in my heart isn't technology and economics. What I feel in my heart is, like when, when I hear the word slavery or when I see or when I see a movie like 12 Years a Slave or Amistad, what I feel in my gut, you can't explain that by technology. You can't explain that by economics. That's moral revulsion. I feel moral revulsion in my gut. Correct? But here, there is great wisdom, great wisdom in the Islamic tradition of ethics and the Islamic tradition of moral epistemology. Muslim scholars, the vast majority, except for the Mu'tazila, we were talking about this earlier, right? And this is why they, are, they were wrong, I think. The, the vast majority of Muslim scholars did not trust your gut. It reminds me of George Bush. Do people, people remember that now? You guys are a lot of old people in the crowd, so you remember George W. Bush. Remember he made decisions about his gut? Muslim scholars do not trust your guts. Why do they not trust guts? Why do they not trust someone feeling morally revolted? Because they, they were dealing with a world that spread from Egypt to Central Asia, from Southeast Asia to Senegal. And there's a... If you, have you ever seen the movie? I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you. This is all research, people, okay? The movie The 13th Warrior with Antonio Banderas, okay, it's about Muslims, people. Muslims are the, the Muslim is the hero of the movie. So it's halal, huh? Yeah, and there's no uh, hanky-panky. Hanky-panky. Yes. There's a lot of violence. No hanky-panky. So... He's this, it's actually a real story, except for the part with the monsters. But until the part with the monsters, it's actually a real story of an Arab diplomat named Ahmed ibn Fadlan, who in the 900s gets sent by the Abbasid Caliph to the land of the Bulgars in Central Asia. And on the way, he meets a bunch of Vikings. And he witnesses a Viking funeral. This is in the book, and it's in the movie. And what's in the movie is accurate to what's in the book. He sees them. I can't describe what they do. It's so disgusting. Just watch the movie, okay? It's so disgusting, I can't describe it. How they clean themselves, I'm going to tell you. They all pass around a little bowl of water, and they all blow their nose into the same bowl and spit into it, and they pass around, and they're drinking it. And sp okay, it's like the worst thing you can imagine. And then they, the, what they do to the body of the person they're burying 
and to the people involved is re- I, this I actually can't talk about. It's, it's really disgusting. And Ibn Fadlan asked them, he says, how can you possibly do this? This is disgusting. And they say, what do you mean? This is, this is totally normal. You guys are the disgusting ones. You take your dead bodies and you put them in the ground where the worms eat them? This is disgusting. How can you do this? So they understood that what grosses people out, what people think is morally disgusting, is really not, it's not a product of some, some way that your body or your mind is in tune with some kind of moral reality that, that f- transfuses in the world or that uh, permeates the world. It's just custom. It's just orf. You guys know the concept of orf? It's just orf. And here's a good example today. If I brought you, who, if I brought, where are you from? Okay. If I brought you a plate of dog meat, like puppy meat with little puppy toes and ears, I said, here's your puppy, here's your dog meat, what would you do? No, I mean, I, I tell you, I probably, like, I'd feel sick to my, first of all, I'd feel this is morally wrong and I'd feel disgusted. Just imagine you're a ra- random American. Random American would be outraged, morally outraged, and they'd be disgusted to the point of vomiting. In southern China, they have dog meat restaurants. Actual restaurants. Okay. The stuff that feels like it's wrong in your gut, that something has to be inherently morally wrong about this, for another person, to another person in the world today, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it just wasn't a big deal. I don't want to ask you this question. This is really, I think, a very good point to keep in mind. If I asked you, if I told you that last week someone had been brutally murdered outside of this neighborhood, what would your reaction be? I mean, that's, that's yeah, that's bad. Like, is that if they catch the person who did it? Uh, do I know the person who, who got killed? Let me ask you a question. I wanted to, how explicit I can be with this audience. Okay, if I told you that um, somebody uh, married a 10-year-old girl, what would you say? A 50-year-old 50, 50 man. We all know the example. No, 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 I'm just... It doesn't work for us. No, I mean, I actually, I, I want to ask, I want to, I, I, I don't know, I, I feel disgusted by that. In my stomach. But guess what? Murder is wrong. Every society in human history considers murder to be wrong. Every society in human history considers murder to be wrong. Yet I told you someone who's murdered, and yeah, it's bad, but I mean, okay. Until, until basically 100 years ago, slavery, slavery was completely normal in many parts of the world. Un, unremarkable, unobjectionable morally to many people in this world. And until, until the mid-20th century, getting married to teenage girls or younger was normal in the United States. And in fact, it's still normal in lots of parts of the world today. So the things we feel the most disgust about, I'd say in America, I'd say the things we feel the most disgust, moral disgust about are slavery and pedophilia. Those are the two things we feel the most moral disgust about. These are two things that were common and unremarkable in the recent past. And the thing that is universally prohibited throughout, universally wrong in all societies, namely murder, yeah, it's wrong, but we don't get disgusted by it. Because disgust is a cultural construct. Disgust is culturally conditioned. What disgusts somebody in one society, I'm not just talking physically, I'm talking morally. What disgusts someone in one society doesn't disgust someone in another society. Because disgust is a way that a culture affects moral change. It's a way the culture affects moral change. So it's not surprising that on those issues where the change has been most dramatic, 
you find the most intense senses of disgust. Okay. Um, for Muslim scholars, Muslim scholars talking about law and ethics, Usuli scholars, what God commands is right. What God forbids is wrong. Those things we can talk about being absolutely right and wrong, absolutely wrong. But for pretty much all other moral feelings we have, those are based on custom. Those are based on orf. Something is ma'ruf or something is munkar. Slavery was ma'ruf and now slavery is munkar. And someone could say, Professor Brown, are you telling me that our moral condemnation of slavery is, is just based on custom? Like the same thing that tells me what kind of wedding gifts to give somebody? How, how dare you belittle, belittle my moral objection to slavery? I'm not belittling at all. In fact, that objection belittles the concept of custom. It belittles the fact that human beings, for most of the, the, their moral transactions in the world and most of their moral actions in the world, their judgments are based on custom. Not based on some kind of universal moral law. And in fact, it's a very unique feature of modern Western society that we assume that everything that we feel is right and we feel is wrong must be a universal. So when we decide that, let's say, it's proper for, for women to dress with their hair showing and wearing short sleeve shirts or for guys to wear, not to wear a hat or something like that, we just assume that this is the normal thing that everybody in the world should do. And that women or men who are not allowed to dress like this in other countries are being oppressed because these are universals. If we decide that it's right for people to be able to engage in all sorts of relationships before marriage, just based on what they feel with no consequences, this must be universal, that everyone in the world should follow. And if they're not being allowed to follow wherever they live, then they're being oppressed. So we live in a society that takes custom and makes it into moral universals. Whereas Muslim scholars understood that customs is, custom is really important. It has real legal meaning for people. It has real moral meaning for people, but that you can't universalize it because it's not fair to do that to other cultures. So for example, if we were to have Sharia uh, courts in America, I'm not advocating Sharia creep, but if we were to have Sharia courts in America, and my wife were to go and say, my husband, he sits around, he doesn't do any work around the house, he doesn't take care of the kids, he just goes out and hangs out with his friends all the time, and I think he's a lousy husband and I want to get divorced from him. My guess is that Muslim scholar applying Islamic law in America would say, yes, your husband is not giving you your haq because in American orf, these are not the duties and rights and obligations of men and women to one another in marriage. The, the obligations of a husband, the obligations of a wife, the rights of the husband, the rights of the wife in Islamic law, these are determined by custom. I mean, there's a few like, out, you know, outlines or boundaries and pillars that are determined by the Quran and the Sunnah, but the details, this is determined by custom. And this is legally meaningful. People will get divorced on this. You have to pay mahar or not pay mahar. Okay. Um, the last thing I, I, I want to talk about, two things, I can't believe I've actually gotten through what I talked about. I'm going to talk about two other issues. One is the change that uh, the change in slavery that was brought by Islam, and the second is abolition of slavery in Islam. It is not exaggeration. It is not, and I will, I will happily go in front of the most skeptical academic audience and say this. This is not me doing some kind of Muslim cheerleading, you know, Islam is great, Muslims invented ice cream, I'm not, I'm not doing that kind of thing. This is completely true. The Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet and the, the legal understanding of the early Muslim community completely revolutionized slavery in the Near East. And slavery in kind of what, the, the, what we would think of sort of the Western world, the one of Central Asia, or Mediterranean world, Europe, and then the Americans. 
the main routes into slavery, the main ways that someone became a slave prior to Islam in the Near East were debt, you owed money, you couldn't pay, you became the person's slave. Capture, as a basically being raided. self dedition which means giving yourself as a slave. This is, people don't know this, but many, many millions of people in human history gave themselves as slaves to other people. Why would they do this? Because they were starving, because they were poor, because they were foreigners in a place where no one protect them, to protect them. And being protected and taken care of was more important to them than their freedom. Selling your children into slavery. This is a major source of slaves in the ancient Near East, in India, until the 20th century in Southeast Asia, in medieval Europe, was giving your, selling your children into slavery because you couldn't afford to keep them or because you owed money. Islam eliminated all of these. There is no debt slavery. And this is very clear in the Sharia. Every once in a while in Islamic history, you see it, for example, in Southeast Asia, in the 1500s and 1600s, you see some debt slavery. But this is a, pre, can, a pre-Islamic tradition that continues. The Sharia prohibits debt slavery. The Sharia prohibits self dedition You cannot give yourself as a slave. The Sharia prohibits selling your children into slaves, into slavery. So the major routes into slavery are all cut off completely. At the, and the, what's interesting is these are actually not mentioned in the Quran or in the Hadiths, but they're simply, it's just like understood by consensus in the early Muslim community, it's ended. There's only one way to become a slave in Islamic law, which is for a Muslim to capture a non-Muslim outside the, the abode of Islam in a war. That's the one way. Or you can be born into slavery if your mother is a slave woman. Um, all right, uh, another really important change that Islam brought for slavery was what happens to the offspring between, b- between a slave, male slave owner and his female slave. So remember I gave you the example of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson's children were, were born slaves. They were born slaves and they were born members of an oppressed class in the United States, which, is, which are African Americans. What's an African American? How do you define African American versus white in the United States? Anybody know? Skin tone? I mean, it, if, can you be like, let's say all of my ancestors are white except for one person, but I have, am I black or white? One drop is, means you're black. White means no blackness. Unless you're able to pass, which means no one can tell that you're black, you have black ancestry. But you can be extremely dark or you can be extremely light, but if you're black, you're black. And otherwise, you can't be part white. You're either white or you're fully white or you're black, right? If, Abraham, if, if Thomas Jefferson had been a Muslim, his children would have been born free. They would have been born free. They would have been legitimate. They could inherit from him. Their mother would have been freed when, he, when, he, when their father died. And this is important. They would have had the same social standing as children born of a free wife. This is also agreed upon in Islamic law completely. Very important. The offspring of a male slave owner and his female slaves are born free, they're legitimate, and they have the same social standing as people born of free women, of free wives. That's why almost all the Abbasid caliphs and all of the Ottoman sultans except one were children not of wives, not of free wives, but of slave women. This is what um, leads to what the scholar of African history, uh, Ali Mazru'i, rahimahullah, who died recently, called ascending miscegenation. Ascending miscegenation. Whereas in America, 
people who were result of mixed free and slave unions went down into the enslaved oppressed class. People who, are resulted in, who were born of those unions in Islamic civilization went up into the free Muslim community. The final thing, the final change brought by Islamic law, or is the Quran and the Sunnah, is an obsession with emancipation. Emancipation is different from abolition. Emancipation means freeing people. Abolition means getting rid of the institution of slavery as a whole. The Quran does not propose abolition. Why not? Because nobody proposed abolition until the early modern period. There's no society that had slaves, which is almost every society in human history, and certainly every civilization in human history. No one proposed the idea of abolition until the early modern period. I want you to understand this very clearly. When you, who saw the movie Spartacus? Come on, that's an old movie. That's okay, right? You guys didn't watch Spartacus? This guy watches everything. Someone needs to talk to him. So the Spartacus, if you see in the, mo- in the beginning of the movie, Kirk Douglas, he's like a slave. And he says, he labored under the sun and the hot sun and the um, dreaming of a day when slavery would die 2,000 years before it ever would. And in the movie, Spartacus gives a speech where we're gonna fight until we free all the slaves in the world or all the slaves in the Roman Empire. That's not at all what Spartacus' rebellion was about. Spartacus wasn't fighting to end slavery. He and his friends, they just didn't want to be slaves. And in fact, they took their own slaves. And all pre-modern slave rebellions, they're not trying to end slavery. They're just trying to get out of their own situation, slavery. And they very often took their own slaves. So yes, abolition is not indigenous to Islam in the sense that it's not present in the Quran and the Sunnah. But it's not indigenous to any religion or any philosophy. It's only something that emerges as an idea in the early modern period, really in the 1700s. What the Quran and the Sunnah do do is they, are, they provide a impulse and an impetus for emancipation that does not have an equal in any religious or philosophical tradition that I've seen pre-modern religious or philosophical tradition. The Quran introduces a few things that are unprecedented. One is it ties the charity tax, the zakat, to freeing slaves. One of the, type, one of the eight groups that can get zakat are slaves to help free themselves. Two, the idea of freeing slaves as expiation for certain sins or as uh, partial punishments or as things you do to expiate sins or crimes. Three is uh, the notion of uh, making that notion of mukataba highly recommended or required. Mukataba is when a slave says, I want to basically buy my own freedom on installments. So the Quran says, if a slave wants to do this, your slave wants to do this, uh, then do it in alimtum fihim khayran. If they are able to do it, if you think they're going to be able to do it, then you should agree. And the, in the, the muwatta of Malik, uh, the caliph Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually makes Anas makes Anas agree to a mukataba request from his slave. So these things are really unprecedented in, in history as far as I know. And the hadiths, the rewards you get for freeing slaves is incredible. The rewards in the afterlife. Now what's really interesting is, not only are there lots of sahih hadiths about this, but Muslims crank out forgeries if you look at books of forged hadiths, like Siyut or Ibn al-Jawzi, you'll find the most outrageous hadiths that are doing what? Urging Muslims to free their slaves. One hadith that's made up in the 800s, I mean, I'm not saying it's made up. Muslim scholars said it's made up. Siyut Ibn Hajar al-Sqalani said this. And if a Siyut says it's made up, it's definitely made up. It's, he's very lax in his standards, or him Allah, right? So this one, it's supposedly the, one of the last khutbahs given by the Prophet He says, if you walk to the mosque, think about this, if you walk to the mosque, every step you take is the equivalent of freeing a slave. Now that's, not, that's, not, that's interesting. That's, that hadith isn't telling you to free slaves, 
But freeing slaves has become so important that freeing slaves is like the unit of measurement you use to talk about the reward you're going to get for something else. Another hadith that's made up in the 900s, uh, the prophet allegedly says, if you, if you, he tells a woman, sabbihi, sabbihi, do, do tasbih of God, right? For every tasbih is the equivalent of freeing 100 slaves. So slavery, freeing slaves is such a basic unit in Muslim understanding of pious life that it becomes a way to count other good deeds. And this impetus to free slaves, this drive to emancipate, is so um, widespread and consistent that if you look in Islamic history, now Islamic history is very long and very broad geographically, but in general, in general, this is a generalization, but I think it's a fairly accurate one. Uh, People who were in... Slaves to Muslims were not slaves for their whole lives. They were usually slaves for like seven to ten years, and then they were freed. And if they became Muslim in that time, they entered the Muslim community as members in good standing, as citizens like anybody else. And by the way, this is another argument for why there was not um, an indigenous movement for abolition in the Islamic world like there was in the Americas, especially the Caribbean in the 1700s and 1800s. Why? If you were, first of all, the majority of slaves brought into Islamic civilization were women who then were made part of families and who had children with those families. So they were integrated into those communities. The second reason is if you were a freed slave in the Caribbean or in the United States, you're still a black person. You could still be re-enslaved, like in the movie 12 Years a Slave. You're still treated like garbage. And worse, you weren't an enfranchised member of society. So the the only way, as long as slavery existed, you were under threat of re-enslavement. The only way to get rid of, to, to ever feel safe, was to end slavery or to do what's called maroonage, which means you basically go and you live in the, some isolated part of an island with other, freed, with other escaped or freed slaves. For Muslims who were freed slaves, they were part of the society. They could, they could be successful merchants. They could be Muslim scholars. They could be saints. In my book, there's a whole section on slave saints, by the way. Saints who were slaves. Awliya. The way that we can talk about abolition in Islamic tradition that I think is the most accurate is to say that, and this is entirely, entirely authentic in the Sharia tradition, that the, as a legal maxim says, يَتَشَوَّفُوا الشَّارِعُ إِلَى الْحُرِيَّةِ The lawgiver, God, looks expectantly towards freedom. And actually, you can find this in one of the earliest books that survived in Islamic tradition, the Kitab al-Tahrish of Dirar ibn Amr. There's a hadith. We talked about this hadith, actually. It's, it, it comes from the very early period. We don't know if the Prophet said it or not, but it's a very early idea. If, you, if a man says to his wife, Inti talaq, insha'Allah, she's not divorced, because God doesn't want divorce. But if you say to your slave, Inti hur, insha'Allah, the slave is freed. Why? Because God wants freedom. So one of the, even if you look in the Kitab al-Muwafaqat of Ashatabi, shatabi died 1388, a major or, or scholar of the Maqasid of the Sharia. He says one of the Maqasid of the Sharia is al-itq, freeing slaves. And if we now live in a time when it's economically, not just economically feasible, but economically profitable not to have slaves, if we can remove the harm of slavery, and this is something I forgot to mention, which I'll shoehorn in really quickly. Muslim scholars always recognized that slavery was harmful. They talked about darar al-riq, the harm of slaves. Slave. What was the harm of slavery? They realized that being a slave was not pleasant for a lot of people. It's, it was, um, you were unable to make your free choices. You were... Uh, like you couldn't, let's say, lead prayer or lead a Jummah prayer. Right? Um, you were unable to benefit from the fruits of your own labor if you wanted. So that's why 
they understood that freeing people was a good thing. That's why there's fadl and itq. There is a, you get a reward for freeing people. But they also understood that it wasn't the most, they, they believed it was not the most important thing. So if someone was, gonna, was like too old or too sick or too incompetent to handle themselves, it was actually wrong to free them because they were going to be in worse off if they were freed. So if we are in a position in world history where slavery is not needed economically, if we're in a position where we can remove the harm of it from people, then the best way to fulfill this maqsid, this aim of the sharia, of emancipation, is simply to do a categorical emancipation and get rid of the institution as a whole. Uh, Jazakum Allah khair, and I can't believe I actually finished this, and uh, I'll try and answer your questions afterwards, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair, uh, inshallah, um, after Salat al-Isha, we will have around 15-20 minutes for Q&A, and I've already gotten a number of questions, but feel free to continue to send them in. Uh, can you, uh, Anze, can you figure out how to make, send them in with the uh, written paper? Um, and also, uh, I know the, the number of people have asked, they're interested in Dr. Brown's personal story as well, of how, uh, you know, he came from converting to Islam to becoming, uh, without praising him too much, but the fact of the matter is he is one of the most famous professors of Islamic studies in the world today. Uh, and uh, this is a very honorable, he's in Georgetown's, you know, Islamic studies professor. And it's definitely a very interesting story from where to where. So a little bit about that as well after uh, Salat al-Isha. But we have five minutes, so I'm going to ask you one question before Salat al-Isha. Um, and that is, you glossed over this issue of, of concubinage. And obviously, this is a very sensitive issue. So in four and a half minutes, if you're able to answer, how do we explain to especially our young men and women, and the outside the faith is obviously different, but our young men, how do we rationalize the concept of milk yameen? Because there is consummation, and what if she doesn't want it? What if, what if, what if? I mean, how do we, so what do you say, what are your thoughts about this from within the paradigm? Okay. Um. I never do this, but I'm going to not answer the question. I mean, it's, there's a whole chapter in it in my book, and that issue you don't talk about without, you know, serious okay. mental preparation. I mean, what I mean is that in the book I was able to, I think, do a very good and thorough job of discussing it. What I, I'll say, I, what I will talk about is one aspect, which is that... Um, and this also comes up in people talk about the notion of like marital rape in Islam and how mm. there's no consent for, you know, legally there's no notion of consent in, 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 for sex within marriage and things like that. Um, and I think this is an instance where we have to understand how other legal traditions work and, and not just get obsessed with the language and concepts that we use in American law, especially modern American law and modern American society. So. We in modern United States think about consent as the, the sort of sine qua non of morally acceptable relationship, right? So consent is what makes something okay. The lack of consent makes it not okay. It makes it not okay morally. It makes it not okay legally. Um, this is fairly unusual in world history, especially the, the fact that this is basically the only moral tool we use in American society. Uh, consent was, is of some importance in most legal and moral systems, but it's usually not the only thing. For example, if somebody wants to be in a relationship which is horribly destructive for them and their family doesn't like it, in a lot of places in the world, what they want doesn't really matter. Their family is going to say, no, you can't be in this relationship, right? So that, the kind of, we don't have that in modern American culture. We don't accept that, right? It's, it's the person's consent, their desire that makes something right or wrong. Um, so I think the first thing to understand is that we have a, we make the concept of consent do a lot of moral and legal work that it's really not uh, up for. And if you're interested in this, I can suggest an excellent book by Joseph Fischel, professor from uh, Yale, and it's called uh, Screw Consent. <laughs> That's what the book's called. It, it's a very interesting, uh, excellent book of you know, political theory and, and, and philosophy. I, I recommend the book. It's not very long. Um, now, 
consent is important in Islamic law. Um, a, a woman who is baligh, right, she cannot be married off in general without her consent, right? Um, but it's not, everybody doesn't have the same kind of power to consent. Uh, your kind of consent is sort of based on your, the amount of importance of that consent is based on your social standing. But the reason why this sort of differed and had a sliding scale is because consent wasn't really how Muslim jurists and ethicists understood right and wrong in relationships. They understood it through the language of harm, darar, right? So if you're a wife and you go to, a, and I have actually collected cases and they're in my book, cases where women go to a judge and say, my, I can't get into the details, but it's, let's just say it's a good read. You'll enjoy it. You won't, you won't put it down, at least not for that section, okay? They go to judge and they say, um, certain things are happening and it's causing me harm. And the judge, it, the, the husband has a right to do those things. In theory, the woman, because she's married to him, has no capacity to consent. But the judge says, you can't do this anymore. Because the harm is what makes something right or wrong. So what the, 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 the work that we do in modern America through the concept of consent, Muslim ethics and Muslim law did through the concept of harm. And you could not harm your slave. I mean, you could discipline your slave in the same way that you could discipline your child, but you couldn't, if you were to go and like um, beat your slave severely in a way that left like marks or made a lot of, of blood uh, flow, then we have instances in the time of the Prophet salam, and in Islamic history, throughout Islamic history, that the judge would force you to free the slave or to sell a slave. Right. Inshallah, we will continue after Salat al Isha, inshallah ta'ala. So please stay for that. Zakumullah khair. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Why don't you take this one? I see. So the first question is that uh, we have been told that uh, some of our Muslim or Arab brothers were involved in the American uh, slave trade. Uh, is this correct in your research and did they is this valid Islamically and did they justify it what they were doing uh, the the Arab slave traders? Okay, yeah um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, So I'm not a specialist in the Atlantic slave trade, but I can from what I do know uh, You know there are, you know people buying you know, buying and selling at both ends, so to speak, right? So uh, most of the slaves who are, I don't, I don't want to say most, because I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I'll say a lot, a large portion of the slaves who are transported from West Africa to the Americas. Remember, most of the slaves uh, went to, to Brazil. Um, there's actually a really good graphic you can see on this for I think from like the African American Muse History Museum or um, I think a, one of the slavery databases they actually have like a chart of all the ships and you can see the majority of them actually go to Brazil um, so they're they're basically being supplied by people who are raiding for slaves in interior in you know various parts of West Africa um, and those people were, uh, some of them are Muslim, some of them are not Muslim. But uh, what's interesting is that, and if you want to read about this, you can read uh, Bilal or Rudolf Ware, um, he's Muslim, the name is Bilal, his book, The Walking Quran, he talks a lot about this, uh, that in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, there's a, a state that's created in what's now essentially Senegambia, a place called Futatora, which uh, arises because these ulama, these two ulama, see Muslims being enslaved and they can't accept that. So they basically start a, a kind of a political movement, military political movement, and create a state in order to make sure that no Muslims are sold into slavery uh, to the Europeans. And they, in fact, strike uh, treaties with the French that no sl French slave ships are gonna come up the Senegal River and 
Uh, eventually, uh, the Europeans like basically give support to other states and they defeat this state, uh, but the Imamate of Fututora. The other thing is that I know at least one scholar in West Africa, I think one of the scholars from uh, the lineage of Mukhtar al-Kinti, a great kind of West African scholarly tradition, he uh, prohibited selling any slave if you thought that that slave might get sold, get then sold to a European. So I, I don't know about, yes, Muslims were involved for sure, uh, but there was also a lot of Muslims, especially Muslim scholars who were really committed to preventing any Muslims being sold into that uh, transatlantic slave uh, commerce or whatever, slave trade. So we have uh, another question here. I'm going to combine two questions. You said, do not trust your gut. How do we understand this in the light of the fitra and also in light of the hadith, al-birru matma'anta ilayhi al-nafsa wal-ithmu ma'haka fi sadrika wa walau aftaka al-nas wa aftawk. Both of these things do have a gut. So how do we say, don't I mean, trust your gut well, versus this? Uh, someone like, you know, Rahimahullah ibn Taymiyyah would talk about the notion of al-aql al-salim. You know, or like, a, a, so it's not that human beings can't have a kind of correct moral sense, but that we need to be very aware that we need to be able to kind of read our moral senses through an awareness of our culture, right? So, um, let's say, you know, I'm American. Um, if someone says something about democracy, I'm going to be like, democracy. If someone says something about tyranny or monarchy, I'm going to say tyranny, monarchy, right? So we kind of have this, uh, we're cultured into a, a view that democracy is good, tyranny slash monarchy is bad. Um, so you just have to be aware, I think, of, of how your, what your biases are. If you know that you have a temper, if you know that you have an ego, if you know that you uh, have a hard time letting go of money or things like that, you know, you, you, I think you have to be aware of what your own failings are, what your own biases are, and then you can, it's at, at that point, like your uh, sense of, your kind of moral intuition becomes more toned, more, more tuned, more, more finely tuned. So I don't mean to say that, you know, your gut is useless, I just mean to say that you need to always be aware that your gut is also a creation of your spa of your circumstances. Do you mind if I add to that? It's you awkward can, being... <laughs> like, you can add as much as you want. Um, uh, as you're probably aware, the third chapter of my gestation is about the fitrah, the concept of the fitrah, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. So uh, just to add to that, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions that the fitrah can be corrupted. And when the fitrah is corrupted, then you will feel the incorrect fitrah telling you something that is incorrect. So hence, this notion of gut instinct is not necessarily right or wrong. So the point is, as Ibn Tabiyah mentions, the fitrah needs a check and balance mechanism. Who's going to check which fitrah is valid or not? So he gave the example of eating something that one culture finds disgusting versus another culture finds not disgusting. The culture that doesn't find it disgusting the culture that has taken it as the norm, how will they know that it is wrong? Because their gut instinct is going to say that it's fine. So even the fitra, it needs a checks and balances. It needs a higher source to tell it. Once the fitra is in line with the higher source, now the gut instinct does kick in, right? So if you have iman and taqwa, then yes, you follow your gut instinct. But if you don't really have iman and taqwa, or you don't have your fitra is not in sync with the Quran and Sunnah, it's been corrupted, then you cannot rely just on your fitra for morality. So that was, a, sorry to No, add, great. Add to that, inshallah. Okay. We have an expert um, on the subject with us. Uh, we have a question here. Um, is warfare the only basis for enslavement? Is the only way to get a slave is, is the Yeah, war? so I, actually I should have mentioned this. Uh, I meant to and I forgot. Um, which is so probably, and it's hard to know because Islamic civilization is very big over a long period of time. But probably most of the slaves who come into Islamic civilization are not captured in warfare, they're, they're bought. So uh, you go to the slave market in Samarkand or Urgench and there's like a Viking guy there who's got like 300 Russian peasants and he says, like, here's 300 Russian peasant slaves for you. Um, so that's like the majority are just purchased from outside. So if someone's already a slave, you can purchase them. Uh, so that's probably how most people entered Islamic civilization, especially from the 
Ru Central Asia, Russian area, which is, by the way, probably the, the majority of slaves in Islamic civilization are from that area. Uh, the, the issue comes with whether the warfare that allows enslavement is like sanctioned by the imam versus just raiding. Because a lot of it is just raiding and there's actually ikhtilaf amongst the ulama about whether that's allowed or not. Um, and what happens in the 19th century when a lot of this, this is, so this is interesting, like we would expect that kind of slave trade in the Muslim world, especially like Africa and Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean world is like kind of decreasing, 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 and then it gets rid of it. That's actually not the case. Its peak in terms of numbers is in the 1800s and 1900s. Like in, in the early 20th century, the, the Red Sea is just teeming with slave trade. So probably more so than earlier. So a, a, a lot of Muslim scholars start getting really concerned about the slave trade in the late 19th century and the early 20th century for two reasons. One, because a lot of Muslims are being enslaved. People going to Hajj from Baluchistan or from Southeast Asia or West Africa were being enslaved. Like Al-Kalbani, you know Imam Al-Kalbani? Mm. Family, his ancestors were Muslim scholars who were going to Hajj and were enslaved. I didn't know that. You can't enslave Muslims. This is unacceptable, right? This is completely unacceptable in the Sharia. Um, so one of the things that they start to talk about, like uh, Muhammad Bayram al khamis who dies in 1889, uh, Abdul Rahman al Kawakabi dies in 1902, then Muhammad Abdul Rashid Rida. The stuff they talk about is actually they're saying that a lot of these, the rating has become unacceptable. Like these, these, they kind of take the position that only a sanctioned, sanctioned warfare by the imam can create prisoners that you can enslave and you can't just go raiding into the Sahara because a lot of times they're enslaving Muslims. So can I ask a very blunt question? Is it true to say that especially towards later Islamic times, most Muslim societies did not live up to the Islamic norms of slavery? in terms of acquiring? That's hard to say. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know if I think, I don't know if it'd be hard to make that generalization. Uh, I'd say that there's certainly, by the late 19th century, it's certainly become a big enough problem that it was like spoiling a system, right? I mean, it was enough, it was problematic enough that when people like Muhammad Bayr al-Khamis or Ahmed Bey, the, the governor of Tunis in 1846, when they said that there's too many people being acquired illegally that we basically have to end slavery, I, I don't think they were making that up. I think that was like a genuine concern of theirs. It became a genuine concern. Okay. Uh, we have a question here that you talked about the fact that Islam is very encouraging to free slaves. What do we say to the argument that since Islam is universal and since the Prophet is the seal of prophets and since Islam came with so many other difficult things, why didn't Islam abolish instead of merely encourage? Why didn't it do that? I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, the answer is that it would be like, I mean, essentially it would be like saying we're going to abolish, you know, transportation. I mean, it wouldn't or we're going to abolish working or walking. It doesn't, it wouldn't make sense for people. And I, and I, I want to repeat this. Nobody thought, it, abolition wasn't some kind of idea that a, a few enlightened souls were arguing for. Nobody was arguing for that. No one conceptualized the idea of abolition. Even slaves who were engaged in slave rebellions like Spartacus weren't thinking about abolishing slavery even in their own area, let alone like globally. It would, it would be like, just imagine a world where in order to move anything, you need a person or an animal to do that. And then just imagine saying, you can no longer use people or animals to move things. I mean, it just wouldn't make sense to people. So uh, th just Im Im imagine the impact that f use of fossil fuels has had on the human, on hum the human race what kind of things that we are able to do with ease today. Like we live lives where the weather means nothing. I mean, we, we live lives where we can, I can literally go to London and come back in the same day. You know, I mean, this is, 
uh, incon- th- this kind of thing is inconceivable to pre-modern minds. So if the, the Quran talked about abolition, it would be like us talking about, I mean, I don't even know, like dimensional transport or something. I guess we do talk about that. But like, you know, it would be like talking about like interdimensional transport in, in like 1800. It wouldn't make any sense. So uh, you also mentioned um, the issue that an argument can be made that uh, Islam does discourage and, and, and encourages, let's say, abolishment. However, is it possible to theoretically claim, open-ended question he's saying, that if the circumstances change, slavery might return, uh, and in the context of Islam, would then that be permissible? So it's interesting you note this because Sheikh... Uh, Muhammad Sayyid Ramadan al Buti, rahimahullah, right? He, in him, one of his books, he actually talks about this. He says that, he says that the, the, the concept of slavery is actually proof of u- Islam's universality. Why does he say that? He says that it, there may come a time when the laws of slavery will actually be ne- needed again. And I don't think that's because he's arguing for the kind of Muslims reintroducing slavery, like ISIS or something like that. It's because I want you to imagine, I call it the Mad Max afterscape situation. You guys watch Mad Max movies? No, of course not. How, how do I, I can't communicate with you people. I know you people watch Mad Max movie. You know Mel Gibson and then silence. Tom. I Dutch, like this okay. silence. <laughs> so imagine like, you know, nuclear war, we're all wearing rubber tire body armor with crossbows driving around we're all going to be like you and me yes or maybe we'll be like partners in this after scape we'll be like Karen Brie Asher and we used to talk about human rights and that stuff wow that was so funny about her. you know so the point is um, imagine a world where we actually don't have fossil fuels don't have um, any kind of uh, way to move things except people or human beings I'm from what I've studied I'm as a if I were a betting man I would argue that there's actually slavery will be reintroduced um, because it will be considered an economic, it would just be an, a, a result of economic course of events. Mm. And at that point, um, you know, human beings either are going to have rules for governing that or not have rules. Uh, so, again, I want to make very clear, because I don't want people really to get the wrong idea, I'm not encouraging this. I'm not saying that I think it's a good idea. I'm not saying that. Islam would think it's a good idea. Again, God wants freedom. God doesn't want slavery. So Muslims should always be uh, on the side of emancipation. But I don't think by any stretch of the imagination it's inconceivable to think that there will be a time in human history that we will uh, again have things that we consider slavery-like in the pre-modern period. Inshallah, let's finish off with two, three questions, inshallah. I'm actually going to combine the next few in one. Uh, and again, I know you, um, you were hesitant to answer, and I fully understand, but I'm being bombarded, and especially there's uh, um, a number of sisters are asking this, obviously. They are, obviously, fully understandably. Uh, one sister says that, as I understand it, masters were not even allowed to slap their slaves. So how can we understand the fact that a Muslim male slave owner is forcing himself on a slave girl and another sister says that um, if emancipation was seen as such a good deed then why did it take so long or why were captured women uh, kept slaves for so long merely to um, uh, you know have a family let's say so I think it's important to here to distinguish between uh, law and application, social application of law. What do I mean by that? Um, if you read like Ibn Hazm's, you guys know Ibn Hazm died uh, uh, 1056, ten, ten, right? A uh, famous Zahiri scholar, 1064, 456, 1064. So his book, uh, Tawq al Hamama, it's translated to English as Ring of the Dove, uh, it's a treatise on love. And he, t- several instances, he talks about uh, men who owned sl- female slaves and who were like deeply in love with those slaves, but the slave didn't like them back, and it just drove those guys crazy. Um, Ibn Hazm himself talks about, by the way, his first love, 
who he didn't get over for decades was a slave woman who was deeply in love with her. And he has a, about a paragraph talking, praising her. Um, so what I mean, and, we, and it's not just uh, Ibn Hazm, but you can see another scholar who's writing in the 19th century in Mecca talks about the idea that he has a friend who's like madly in love with his slave woman, his own slave woman, and who is like crying because she won't, she's not interested in him. So uh, I, I think it's important to remember that just because, and Ibn Hazm even says this, he says, these men, these women were their property. They could do what they wanted with them, but they're love, they're love sick and they're heartbroken because they're not interested in them. So, I, you know, I, I, just, I don't think that Muslim men were just, uh, sorry, one and just, yeah. I, I don't think that Muslim men, just because they were legally allowed to do something that necessarily followed that that's what they wanted to do all the time. And as I said before, it's very important to keep in mind that the work that in our legal and moral system we do through the concept of consent, Muslim scholars and Muslim ethics did through the concept of harm. Right? So if, um, if a slave woman was harmed by her owner's approaches to her or her owner's access of her, that was something that she could go to a judge and complain about and get relief from and get potentially maybe freed because of. And we have instances of that, instances of this. This is not like a theoretical thing. We have like fatwas about this. We have court cases about this. Okay. Uh, final question and then I have your personal question as well. So final question related to the topic and then a question about your life. Uh, question related to the topic. Uh, how do you address the fact that many pre-classical scholars of Islam thought of marriage as a form of slavery? I don't think they thought of marriage as a form of slavery. I think they used slavery as a, a the language as an idiom for talking about marriage. Marriage is definitely not a form of slavery because ma wives are not slaves. They're not slaves. That's like a base. You can In fact, you cannot marry your slave. In in Sharia, you either you can either free you can free them and then you can marry them, but you can't marry your slave. So, um, what they you know, when we, for example, when we talk about marriage in the modern United States, what do we say? We say it's a partnership. Right? We say it's a, you're a team. I don't know, things like, what, what other things do we talk about, right? You know, oh, you say it's a partnership, like a business partnership? I mean, think about the fact that we, societies can have different idioms for legally talking about a relationship. Mm. And just because they, you choose that legal idiom doesn't mean that that is the nature of the relationship for those people involved. So Muslim scholars use the concept of milk, of property, when they're talking about marriage, but it doesn't mean that marriage was like equivalent of slavery or some modified version of slavery or something. So I think it's important to not get kind of legal language and legal idioms mixed up with uh, the actual definition of these things in Islamic law or how they were understood. Okay, and here's the question that a lot of people have been asking me to ask you. Can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about your own conversion and your journey through Islam for the 7,627nd time? Uh, but I think there's, this is online in a multiple we don't watch. Form. We don't watch online. We don't watch videos, do we? Right? <laughs> you guys are killing me. Someone actually wants to know this. Do you guys want to know why he converted to Islam in his story? Yes. Okay, fine. I need to get a card I can just hand people. So, yes, I was a uh, long time ago. I was, I, was, I was raised in Washington, D.C. suburbs. You guys know Brett Kavanaugh? Yeah, the, I'm from the same neighborhood as a Brett Kavanaugh, but I'm not. We to, all know Brett Kavanaugh. No, no, but he's. Uh, we don't know Mel Gibson. He made. We he, don't know. he made my. He gave my neighborhood a bad name, uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland. But uh, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm from, sub suburb of outside of Washington D.C. Total population of non-white people, zero. <laughs> Except for some like Africans who work for the World Bank or something, but there's like no. It's, it's a super. Um, rich white person place. So the, that's where I grew up and I was raised um, 
Christian, I was raised Episcopalian Christian, uh, which is like American Anglican church. But uh, I went to church every Sunday. We had to go to church every Sunday, but, and I was an acolyte. I went all the way through the, finished the senior level of acolyte. Those are the guys who help with the minister, they help the communion, they carry the cross and wear the outfits. Like you see those English boys with those white outfits and the red and the black. That's what I used to wear on Sundays. That's also how I learned, by the way, that I was definitely going to be an alcoholic because when they brought around the communion wine, like you would get it first as the, as the acolytes, and I would chug as much as I Stop. could. I loved it, even as a child. So I, I would be a, if I were not Muslim, I think I'd be a functional alcoholic. That's my theory. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, yeah, but, but it was interesting because we didn't uh, talk about, we went to church, but religion had no place in our household. So we didn't, like, there was no, no one ever talked about God or anything in my house. It was, so it was really weird. I'm the most religious person by far in my family. Uh, but anyway, the point is I didn't have like a lot of religion. Christianity wasn't really a, a big deal for us. Uh, so then I went to high school. I went to boarding school in California. I went to boarding school in the same town Hamza Yusuf, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf went to boarding school in which is called Ojai, California, which no one knows about. But we went to rival high schools, plus he's older than me. And his dad, by the way, was a teacher at the boarding school that my dad was a student at. So my, wow. my dad might have studied with his dad. But my dad died, so I couldn't ask him that question. So uh, then I went to high school in California, and uh, I had a lot of existential angst as a teenager. This might be normal. The people that, I had a lot of existential angst. Like It was almost incapacitating for me. Then when I went to uh, Georgetown for college, they have, um, you have to take two theology requirements. You have to take either Problem of God, which I didn't take, or you take Intro to Biblical Literature. I took Intro to Biblical Literature, and I was like, this is really interesting, but I don't think I, I want to follow this. And then I, the next class I took was a randomly, just totally randomly uh, on Islam. And because I had this friend in my dorm who was actually a Palestinian guy, I had no idea about Islam. And one time I asked him, I was like, hey, uh, how much does a camel cost? Like, I asked that non-ironically, like, not as a joke. I, I actually wanted to know. And he really, he was like, two women. And then I was like, what? And he's like, no, I'm just messing with you. He's like, I don't know. I've never seen a camel in my life. But the point, he's still, he lived in the UAE. But the point is, he's, I had zero idea about Islam. But I took, I was like, oh, it's interesting. I'll take this class on Islam to fulfill my second requirement. And the, you know who taught is the niece of uh, Ismail al-Faruqi, rahimahullah, Maysam oh. al-Faruqi. She taught the class, and we read Muhammad Asad's book. We read the, his translation of the Quran, and we read the Road to Mecca. Yeah. And the Road to Mecca really, like, bowled, bowled me over. Amazing. And I think kind of by the end of that semester, it was spring semester my freshman year, I was really, like, I just really felt like a Muslim. And that summer I spent thinking a lot about the issue and stop eating pork and stop drinking and things like that. And then the, in the fall, when I went back to, to my sec second year, I, uh, I went to the MSA, eat dinner at the beginning of the year, and I, um, I, said someone, I, I told someone I'm interested in becoming Muslim, and that was it. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'd like to uh, uh, obviously thank Dr. Jonas Laurent. He is an extremely busy person. Um, you didn't never told the story of the book. I'll just qu quickly mention it. Uh, that uh, small controversy happened when he was giving a lecture. Small, very small controversy that took over the national media for a short period of time. Uh, where he basically told a Muslim in the audience, like, are you a Muslim? The guy said, yes. And he said, if you're a Muslim, how can you, uh, you know, dismiss slavery as being immoral when the Prophet himself had a milk yameen? I mean, it's a contradiction. You're either this or that. And he said this in an audience of non-Muslims as well. No, no, there were no, it was all Muslims. Oh, it was all Muslims. But then it got picked up by the non-Muslim no, media. That, that oh, okay. person is actually a total idiot. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, he's just a moron. And he then got all upset about this. And... Actually, the funny thing is, people, he's actually a white guy. That's the funny. He's like a middle aged white guy who got up. Anyway, he, he was really up. And then he, uh, did you guys remember Milo? Yes. You remember Milo? I was Milo's last victim. Milo attacked mm. me, and then Milo went down. You just remember this. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when uh, uh, Dr. Brown was basically uh, put under the spotlight, how do you respond when you're a professor at Georgetown? You write a 350-page book. So he dropped all of his other projects, and within two days, was it, or four days? I don't know, I'm just exaggerating, but subhanAllah, amazing fast turnaround. 
he publishes a book. Oh, where's the book? It's over there. Um, so I have the book, and I encourage all of you to get it. And it, uh, it's a very readable book. It's not, it's not something that's only meant for PhDs in the ivory towers. It's meant for the inquisitive mind. That's the great thing about the book. It's actually meant for people that are struggling with these issues. And it's very, very readable. It's something that you will enjoy. I'm currently almost finishing it. Well, I haven't quite finished it yet. Uh, and uh, it's a very enjoyable book. So I do encourage you to uh, purchase the book. Uh, and it's uh, something that, inshallah, will be of great benefit. I'd like to thank Dr. Brown uh, for spending uh, so much of his time, precious time. He's on his other project now. He keeps on coming out with books and articles and puts all the rest of us to shame. I don't know how he does that, subhanAllah. No friends. <laughs> um, and mashallah, also his family is very supportive. His wife's won two Emmys or three? I forgot. Two Emmys. His wife has won two Emmy awards, mashallah, tabarakallah. So just a bit of pressure on him to also, you know. Not as an actress, as a uh, producer, <laughs> as a journalist, just to be clear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two Emmy Awards as a producer and journalist. So just a small bit of pressure on him to write another 15, 20 books to make up for that. But alhamdulillah, I would like to thank him immensely for coming down. He literally just came down for, for this talk. He's flying out back in early tomorrow morning. Uh, he just came down in the afternoon today. So jazakumullah khair. I hope that inshallah you also benefited and enjoyed your stay here. And inshallah, we do plan to invite him again for more difficult topics that uh, only somebody in his position and tenure track and or tenured professor can say the rest of us cannot say so jazakumullah khair may Allah Azza wa Jal continue to bless you and guide you and guide others through you and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to uh, cause you and all of us to be instruments of izza to Islam and through Islam through what you are doing you are one of the very very few people I know and I'm sorry to praise you in front of your face but our audience should know a practicing proud Muslim in the halls of academia is very 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 rare somebody who is unabashedly Muslim somebody who defends Islam and the values of Islam at a place you know like Georgetown I mean it's something that subhanallah uh, almost unheard of one of the very few people so we thank Allah that we have somebody like Dr. Brown and we ask Allah to continue to give him thabat and to make him firm and to make him a source of, of, of izzah uh, for Islam and through Islam Jazakumullah khair Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh